This week on the CNET Tech Review, our wish list for the iPhone 5, hot new phones from HTC and Samsung, perk up your iPhone's puny battery life, and the Kobo Vox takes aim at the Kindle Fire. It's all coming up right now. Hi everyone, I'm Molly Wood and welcome to the CNET Tech Review where we collect our hottest videos of the week and tell you what's good and what's bad in the world of tech, plus offer our own unique tech wisdom in the form of the bottom line. Let's start things off with the good. Good news for those of you who have been waiting for all the cool Windows Phone phones to come out, they are starting to arrive. Samsung announced two new Windows phones this week and one of them is even 4G. Have a look at the Focus S and the Focus Flash. Hi, I'm Bridget Carey with CNET, and we're here with two new Windows phones from AT&T, the Samsung Focus S and the Samsung Flash. Now, they're sister phones, but the Focus S has a bigger screen, it's 4.3 inches, and it has a better camera in the back, 8 megapixel. The Focus Flash is your lower end one. It's a little on the cheaper side, it's a smaller screen, 3.7 inches, and a 5 megapixel camera in the back. Now, as sister phones, they both have a lot in common. They're both Mango, so that's Windows 7.5. They both have an internal 1.4 gigahertz processor, and I'm told they both have the same amount of memory as well. And they're both on the AT&T HSPA Plus 4G network. Now, the Focus S is going to be about $200 with the contract, and the Focus Flash is going to be about $50. So, definitely, for a more affordable phone, you're just going to get a little bit of, in a smaller package, but internally, it's about the same. Now taking just a look at the Focus S, this is a very thin phone. It has a plastic back, but it has a nice um, texture to it, so it doesn't feel too slippery. You have a dedicated camera button on the top here, and you also have that in the lower end focus flash. Both have a front-facing camera. This one is 1.3 megapixels. Design-wise, there's just uh, small differences, uh, as you can see in the focus flash, there's a little bit of a button design on the Windows Home button, and you don't see that on the Focus S. So there you have it. If you're looking for a Windows phone, this is the latest and greatest from AT&T on the Windows side, and you have two different options to go with depending on your budget. For CNET TV, I'm Bridget Carey. Bridget Carey was on serious New York phone duty this week because Samsung wasn't the only company dropping new phones. HTC has another new Android option, and this one is all about the Beats. Hi, I'm Bridget Carey with CNET TV here at the launch event for the HTC Resound on Verizon. Now, this is a pretty powerful phone. It's going to be top of the line. You're going to have a 1.5 gigahertz processor. Inside, you're also going to get 16 gigs of internal memory and an SD card that has another 16 gigs attached to it. But let's talk about the screen. This is a 4.3 inch high definition 720p screen. The first time you're going to see that out of HTC. So the camera's 8 megapixels with a flash and it records at 1080p HD. And the camera itself has a few extra little features in it like being able to take action burst shots really fast or play back your video in slow motion. And the camera's designed to really intake a lot of light more so than other cameras. So supposedly you should be able to take some really good shots in low lighting. It takes a lot of hints from the HTC Incredible in terms of design, kind of a curved back, kind of this soft textured finish on the back with some red highlights. And the B here is for Beats Audio. That's the big standout feature in this because they integrated Beats Audio technology so your music's going to sound a little better and it comes with Beats Audio headphones. You're also going to notice HTC Sense 3.5 which has unique new features like having your customizable icons on the lock screen so I could take it and just kind of drag it right into there so it'll immediately open up my messages, mail, whatever I want to put in there. Also, when you go into Leap View, you'll be able to customize the order of each of these screens or just drag one and delete it right from here. Overall, I can tell this is a very smooth experience. I only had a few minutes with it, but just by looking at some of the videos, very sharp and bright imagery. So we'll have to take it back to our labs to get a really longer look at it, but initially, it's pretty sweet. It comes ice cream sandwich ready, so it's going to have gingerbread to start, but expect an update on ice cream sandwich, say, maybe at the beginning of next year. And it's going to be available November 14th from Verizon at $299.99. For CNET, I'm Bridget Carey. So it's got good sound, video and photo editing on the phone, and a low light sensor for better pictures in the dark. Party phone, people. You heard it here first. 
But for some of you, none of these new amazing phones can fill the hole that was left when Apple announced the 4S and not the iPhone 5. I know, it hurts. So in this week's top five, in addition to counting down the features we're still waiting for when the 5 does arrive, Ryan Cooley also offers a lesson in the classic stages of grief. You know, it's funny. The release of the iPhone 4S was kind of like a Kubler-Ross experience. There was denial. No, I don't mind. It's not an iPhone 5. Anger. Wait, it's not an iPhone 5. Bargaining. Come on, Apple, please, just one more thing. Depression. Whatever. I guess I'll get a droid. And then acceptance. Hey, the iPhone 4S rocks. Well, now we're through that neurosis, we can move on to what the iPhone 4S immediately makes us think of what we want in the iPhone 5. I'm Brian Cooley here with the top five things in that category, leaving out the silly stuff like removable batteries, expandable storage, or flash support, the stuff that Apple's never going to do, and taking you right to the realm of reality. We're going to rank these by how likely it is we'll get each feature. Here we go. Number five, NFC, that's near field communications. This is that swipe to pay with your phone technology that all the banks and merchants and payment networks are cranking up in 2012, and which most consumers think is some kind of voodoo that will siphon their bank account, expose their ID, or both. That notwithstanding, it's pretty likely Apple's gonna build NFC into the five because they have a big stake in the payment space due to iTunes. Chances here, about 40%. Number four is better battery life. The 4S, pretty much just did a lateral on this front. So now Apple's really on the hook to make the 5 go longer on a charge, especially since the MacBook Air goes all day on one, and it's a laptop, and the iPad goes all month on a charge. That makes the iPhone the one Apple product that doesn't really have a standout battery story to tell. New CPUs and GPUs we expect in the 5 are going to help out here, and the odds on this one, about 50-50. Number three is actually the number one thing CNET users like you tell us you want. That is, a screen bigger than a postage stamp. The long-standing three-and-a-half-inch iPhone display is just plain dinky these days. You really feel it when watching a video or if you use the phone as a navigation device. Yet we still rank bigger screen at maybe 50% likelihood because of the battery hit that a bigger display might mean, see number four, and the fact that the same users who want a bigger screen also say they don't want a bigger phone. That can be tough. Number two, 4G. If the iPhone 5 doesn't have 4G, I will officially whistle Apple's golden era dead. You see, 4G phones and networks are a little green right now, but by the time the iPhone 5 comes out, 4G phones are going to be it, and the 3Gs are going to be moving fast into the bargain category. Also, 4G bandwidth is going to do wonders for iCloud, which might dovetail nicely with an expansion of that service to finally work with video for the first time. Odds here? A solid 80%. Okay, before we hit number one, remember another reason for a lot of the anticipation that will be built up around the 5 are the reports that it was the last product Steve Jobs really focused on reportedly allocating the limited time he knew he had left to this product. It makes sense. It's far and away Apple's biggest thing in their entire lineup, and therefore it may be the last physical evidence we ever get of Jobs' vision. Okay, the number one thing we think we'll see and want to see in the new iPhone 5 is going to be a whole new design. Now, we don't know what the new look might be. Thinner, more sculpted, wider, longer, curvier, who knows? Those are all in play, as well as a bunch of crazy ones that I won't even bore you with. But we know this. In the handheld phone space, you have to change up your design once in a while to keep the coals burning under the hype machine. Also, consider patents we've seen that suggest backside multi-touch is coming. This isn't that thing you try and get away with in a strip club. It's a technology where you control the screen from behind the device. Or perhaps we'll get a completely button-free phone. Both of those ideas would create a more spacious screen experience, which answers your number one request. Whatever it is, a new design is 99% likely, with just 1% reserved in case Tim Cook drinks a whole lot more than we know. If you're intrigued by this short list and want to see the full one, including the stuff that everybody wants and that Apple will never give you, 
Check out David Carnoy's full 15 item slideshow on things we want to see in the next iPhone. You can find a link to that and a lot more top fives like this at top5.cnet.com. I'm Brian Cooley. Thanks for watching. Since Apple has now admitted that iOS 5 is causing battery problems on the iPhone 4S, I wouldn't be surprised to see that issue rise in the top five rankings. Apple said a fix is on the way, but if you don't want to wait that long, Sharon Backman has some tips to prolong your battery life right now. Hey everyone, I'm Sharon Vaknin for CNET.com, here to help improve the terrible battery life that came with iOS 5, especially on the iPhone 4S. The issue is so bad that Apple is investigating the problem and might release a fix, but until then, I have a few solutions you can try right now. Grab your phone and head to Settings to get started. One tip many people swear by is resetting your network settings. First, go to General, Reset, and select Reset Network Settings. Enter a passcode if you have one, and your phone will restart. This won't erase any data, but you'll have to re-enter your Wi-Fi passwords. Now, go to Location Services and turn off any location services you don't need. These services drain a ton of battery since they force your phone to constantly find your location. The biggest offender in this list is probably Reminders, because if you set up a location-based reminder, your iPhone will always monitor your location as it waits to activate your reminder. So you can either disable it here or hold off on using location-based reminders until this battery issue is fixed. Once you turn off these services, head down to System Services and disable location-based iAds and Setting Time Zone, which you can turn on again when you travel across time zones. All right, we're done with location services, and the next step is to turn off diagnostic reports your phone may be sending to Apple periodically. So now head to General, About, Diagnostics and Usage, and select Don't Send. This next setting is Siri-related and only applies to the iPhone 4S. Go to General, Siri, and turn off Raise to Speak. This is a handy feature, but it consistently drains your battery by monitoring your iPhone's light sensor to activate Siri. It's not fair that we have to disable useful features for better battery life, but until Apple releases a fix, this could be the best solution. If you did all of the above and you're still seeing crappy battery life, some users in the Apple community forum say you should condition your battery. So let your battery die, which shouldn't take long, then completely recharge it by using an AC adapter. In general, you should do this at least once a month. With these settings in place, you should see your battery life improve, but this doesn't mean Apple is off the hook for this issue. If you have any battery saving tips, let me know on Twitter or my Facebook page, and I'll repost them on howto.cnet.com. For CNET, I'm Sharon Vaknin. Even if you find that your new 4S can make it through the day with plenty of charge to spare, these tips can also help if you know you're going to be away from a charger over the weekend or in a remote area. Or you could just turn off your phone and enjoy the scenery. Yeah. That concludes the cell phone portion of our show for today and now is as good a time as any for a break. We'll be back with more tech review right after this. Welcome back to the CNET Tech Review, our weekly video digest of all things good and bad we've seen here at CNET TV. Continuing on in the good, the 2011 Dodge Charger is more likely to turn heads for its exterior styling, but as Wayne Cunningham shows us, the Charger is equally impressive on the inside. Hi, I'm Wayne Cunningham with CNET, taking a close look at Dodge's new infotainment center here in the 2011 Charger. Now the first thing you'll notice about this system, it's got a massive screen. This is 8.4 inches and there's no plastic buttons around the outside. Dodge put all the function buttons in a menu across the bottom here. Now if I push the navigation button, I get a really familiar screen here. This is actually Garmin navigation software that Dodge integrated into the new infotainment center. Now this is pretty good stuff, it's got really good route guidance. If I switch to this plus button here, that gives me serious travel link. In the Sirius Travel Link, I get movie listings, sports scores, gas prices, and weather. And that stuff is integrated with the navigation system. So if I find a gas price that I like, I can actually just hit that button and it'll send the address of that gas station to the uh, navigation system. Now, if I go to the stereo, I hit this player icon here, 
and I get a lot of digital audio sources. I get Bluetooth streaming audio, I get USB drive, I got iPod integration, and even SD card. Now I've got a USB drive actually plugged into the car right now, and this system used the uh, integrated GraceNote database to parse all the MP3 tracks that I've got on there, and now I can browse the tracks on that, that drive by album, genre, artist, all the normal things you'd find in an MP3 player. With the phone system here, I can get an on-screen keypad and I can actually just manually enter a number, or the system also copied the phone book from my paired phone to the system and I can search through and find any name on there. I can also use voice command to call a number just by hitting this steering wheel button and saying, call Wayne Cunningham. Which phone for Wayne Cunningham would you like to call? So the system actually found three numbers associated with my name in the contact list and asked me which one of those I want to call. So this system brings Dodge up to date and includes all the modern features we'd expect in a car infotainment center in a nice big screen. So this has been a close look at Dodge's new infotainment center here in the 2011 Charger. I'm Wayne Cunningham for CNET. So that's a look at the infotainment system in the Charger. To see how the rest of the car fares, you can find Brian Cooley's video in the car tech section at CNETTV.com. And now might be a good time to do that if you're an LG employee, because the time has come for the bad. There are a lot of amazing TVs out there and prices just keep getting better, which makes it even more disappointing that LG kind of blew it with this one. Hi, I'm CNET Senior Editor David Katzmeyer, and this is the LG 42 LK450. This is a 42-inch LCD TV. There's also a 32 and a 37-inch member of the series. This review will apply to all three. This is one of LG's least expensive TVs for 2011. It uses a CCFL backlight, which means that it's uh, not the LEDs found on a lot of the higher-end LCD TVs this year. Seen from the side, you can tell it's not an LED TV. It's a little bit thicker, but still plenty thin. The set's design is really not all that inspiring. Around the uh, bottom, you'll see this sort of sandy strip to sort of set it off uh, against the glossy black. Uh, all told, we find the look a little bit uninspired, but then again, it's an entry-level TV. Unlike some TVs at this level, the LG does have a swivel stand, however. The feature set on the LK450 is pretty bare bones. It's a 60 hertz refresh rate, which means that it doesn't have the 120 hertz found on some higher end TVs. Not a big loss in our book. The TV doesn't have the DLNA streaming found on some Samsung models, but it does allow you to plug in a USB port to the side and look at videos, photos, and music, so that's one little extra. One area where LG didn't skimp was the picture settings. There's a slew of picture presets in addition to a 10-point grayscale and full color management system. So if you're tweaking this TV, you'll find all the controls found on many higher-end televisions. It's a real plus at this level. Around back, you'll find two HDMI, two component video, a PC input, and a third HDMI, as well as a headphone jack around the side. So all told, it's one of the better equipped entry-level TVs in terms of connectivity. When we took the LG into the lab, we were a little bit disappointed by its picture quality compared to some of its peers. The real weakness is its very light black levels. When you look at this TV in the dark, you can see the blacks are relatively gray and they don't have that punch that a lot of the TVs at its price level from Sony and Samsung, for example, can deliver. On the flip side, we did appreciate the accurate color, uh, again, helped by those extensive picture adjustments. The TV does miraculously handle 1080p24 cadence correctly, despite being a 60 hertz TV, so that's kind of a bonus. Leave your Blu-ray players at 1080p24. We also appreciated the matte screen, but all told, thanks to those uh, pretty weak black levels, this TV is one of the worst performers at this price point. That's a quick look at the LG LK450, and I'm David Katzmeyer. It sounded pretty promising right up until the very end. You can tell your friends from LG to come back into the room now as we move along to this week's bottom line. The Kindle is the undisputed king of e-readers right now, and the Nook is trying to be the prince. So is there any room for an upstart? Kobo is hoping that the answer is yes. I'm David Carney from CNET. I am here with Matthew Welsh from Kobo, and we are here with the new Kobo Vox um, e-reader tablet. Uh, this is a $199 uh, tablet that is powered by Android. It is Android 2.3, right. um, and Matthew's going to tell us a little bit about the device and its highlights. 
Yeah, and you can see from the beginning here that the device uh, starts with the home screen, which is uh, very book-centric. Beyond that, you have all of the other things you would expect in an open Android platform that's completely uh, customizable. It weighs about 14.2 ounces, and it comes with 8 gigabytes of memory. 8 gigs and expandable to 32. So I think it'll hold, uh, you know, our, our normal Kobo Touch will hold 1,000 books. This will hold 8,000 books, and if you want to expand it with the, uh, the 32, it can hold, you know, over 30,000 books. So it's uh, quite a large library. 800 megahertz processor, very similar to the uh, Barnes & Noble Nook Color. Some of the other features it has, uh, you talked about the screen earlier. Uh, what makes this screen special compared to other screens. Obviously people love our e-ink screens because you can read them in bright sunlight. When you go to a color reading device, we looked around and we found the FFS Plus screen. Uh, I don't know what FFS Plus stands for, but I think it stands for you can read it outside. Yeah. Because effectively, uh, we looked around and we found that the type of screen technology used in the cockpits of fighter planes is this technology. There's no Android market on the device. It is your own store, your own Android store, <laughs> and it just has free apps. Exactly. So we have 15,000 apps, and uh, you can also get, you know, our whole philosophy is read freely. So uh, you, can, uh, you can basically get apps from anywhere else, sideload them on here. Uh, the whole device is built around freedom. So it's an open Android platform. You can customize the look and feel of it as you like. In fact, the product itself comes in four different colors. Uh, you're free to use whatever browser you want. Uh, you're free when you buy books from Kobo to use them on any other device, or if you bought books from another device, to bring them onto a Kobo. And so we're, we're looking at pretty similar battery life to the Nook Color at around seven hours. Yep. It has the quilted back, the, the <laughs> signature Kobo quilted back. Um, we have a great social, uh, new social feature called Pulse. And with Pulse, you can, for the first time, kind of uh, books come to life again. So you get all of the things you would get in a, in a virtual book club. Uh, now integrated into an underlay within the book itself. So if you want to say that you like a page, that you've started reading a book, you want to make a comment in the book, you want to see the comments that other people make on the book, all of that can then show up directly in the Facebook ticker. So uh, obviously some of the um, potential revenue stream is in doing paid apps for Android. Um, you guys are just doing free apps. Is that conscious decision that you can't actually buy paid apps from any store? Yeah, uh, it's just it's the way it is right now. It's certainly not a it's certainly not a, a great strategic uh, position there. But uh, to the extent to which people want free things, uh, we give them free things, right? <laughs> we don't have a lot of people clamoring, "Please take my money for apps." You also talked about adding even more fonts. Um, is that a yeah. new feature in this, or is that part of your apps uh, strategy as well? In our initial version, we had you know a certain range of font sizes. When we went to touch, we went up to 17 font sizes. Uh, now with this, we're up to 42 font sizes, and it turns out that people appreciate if they have bifocals or trifocals being able to put their glasses down and just read a book the old-fashioned way. All right, thanks, Matthew, for all that. Uh, that is the new Kobo Vox tablet e-reader. And I'm David Carnoy, and thanks for watching. The bottom line this week, enjoy third place, Kobo. Since the Kindle Fire and the newest Nook are due to go on sale in the next week or two, the future of the Kobo Vox looks a little bleak. Although there is something kind of tempting about all that openness and the jet fighter glass, that is cool. That's going to do it for this time, but come back next week for an all-new CNET Tech Review. Until then, there are tons of great videos available every day at CNETTV.com. See you next time, and thanks for watching.